Christ is risen. And one of the greatest beauties of that is the hope that it brings. Our story today comes before the disciples could fully wrap themselves around that fact that Christ was risen. There were, there were questions popping up from the stories of the women, but they didn't yet know it in the marrow of their bones. Because in the marrow of their bones was still sadness and was still probably a touch of despair. This is one of my favorite resurrection stories because it's so ordinary. And because it reminds me of the most basic promise of the resurrection and of new life. Um, I don't know about you all. I'm not one that deals with failure well. <laughs> um, it makes me really cranky, and that's putting it mildly. Um, and so whether that's um, how I feel that the world has failed me or how I feel I have failed myself or others, um, I find in this story um, the promise of how to deal with it. We have two disciples who felt that everything had failed and fallen apart. We have the followers of Jesus who were surrounding him through this Passover festival and all that was happening watched all their hopes disintegrate. And so now they are returning to their nets, to their tax booths, to their work, to their daily routine. Because that's how we cope with failure when it happens. We go back to what we know and we bake our world smaller and we stay where we can and do what we can until we work through it enough in whatever way that we can step out again. Although some of us don't ever figure out how to step out again. This one passage in Luke opens with one sentence of the, of the travelers on the road in conversation trying to process everything that happened while they're going back to their daily routines. But we know that that conversation can be a lifetime. And the miracle that I find in this story isn't the breaking of the bread and the recognition at the end, but that these two disciples and followers let their conversation and let their pain be interrupted by a stranger. Because if I'm on a walk processing everything and working through everything, and that's the way I do it best, because surprise, surprise, it helps if my body's in movement for me to think clearer. And if I am in that mode of crunching through things and processing and reflecting, then the last thing I want is somebody coming up behind me being like, hey, what's you doing? <laughs> what are you thinking about? What are you talking about? And then to find out that I have to explain everything to this person while I'm in the middle of feeling all the feelings. Yeah, I think part of the miracle is that that conversation on the road even happened in the first place. And I also think that that's the miracle of the passage in Acts. We have Peter, this is after Pentecost, who's stepping out and giving his sermon and teaching who Jesus is. And there are people there who he names and pretty much accuses um, of putting Jesus to death. And in that moment, instead of defensiveness and how dare you say that of us, 3,000 people are baptized because they ask Peter, well, what do we do then? And there's a power of witness and testimony in both of these places um, and being who we are. This isn't Peter accusing a group that he's not a part of, of what they've done. This is Peter talking in his own family of what they've done together. Remember, Peter was a part of the denial and the abandonment. And the disciples and the followers on this road listened to Jesus as he called them out, too, for not remembering the scriptures and for reteaching them. And in that ownership and in that space and in that honesty, New life came, and new beginnings started to come together. And they came together in fullness in the breaking of the bread. Communion and food will always be at the center of who I am, because there's just a moment of care and love that happens there that 
I personally don't feel anywhere else in life. But there's also an understanding and a conversation that happens before we even get to communion that the followers of Jesus had with Jesus on the road, that Peter had in the sermon and the back and forth um, at Pentecost. And that's why I have a prayer for us and for all United Methodist churches that we can reclaim our roots as Methodists um, in that our denomination and our movement was founded in small groups and people coming together and meeting regularly to support each other, to walk with each other, to be able to bring all of the failures we have experienced and all of the joys and our heartwarming moments together to be able to share them together. And we have a Bible study starting up on this Thursday, and it's a step, but I want for all of us to not just be considering coming to this study, but to be considering a call to lead studies or prayer groups or ways to gather together on a regular basis to help each other in this journey. Um, because it is an interruption, and it can be annoying, and I will say that there are plenty of times where Thursdays come, and I'm tired, and all I want to do is to go home. Um, and the last thing I want to do is have one more thing that I have to show up for and be at. And as hard as it might be for me to get over that hump, I can also say that, you know, I have to because it's my job, which is a helpful um, thing because every single time, and I mean that, not as an exaggeration, but every single time I leave, I remember why I make room for that interruption in my daily routine. Because there is a knitting together and an understanding and a support that happens that shifts the routine and all that I have been fretting over or all that I've been excited over and is space for all of that to come together. And I want all of us to be able to have the experience of what it feels like to be so focused and processing what has happened and then have an interruption come and have a moment of revelation and epiphany where we see clearly and everything, all the pieces that we've been trying to sort through come into place. And we who were at, exhausted at the day's end, then receive enough energy in that moment and in that gathering and in that caring and in that breaking of bread to run another seven miles to be able to share that new beginning and that joy and that purpose. If we can do that together, friends, then we will know resurrection, not just in an Easter season of 50 days, but in every day of our life, in every step. And that is something that I want for myself <laughs> and for all, with all of who I am. So instead of keeping talking about this, let's practice this. It's not a coincidence that um, we um, move next week's communion up to today because there is no way we can have this story and come together and worship without gathering around the communion table. And we have a spaghetti dinner afterwards. So there is plenty of times and moments to have the experience right now of that love and that understanding breaking through and changing our day and maybe even setting a tone for the coming week. So, Bill, would you join me um, up front? And we will share in communion together. <laughs>